but I joined uh, the East Orlando team almost uh, three years ago. Um, I actually did my training here in Orlando at Florida Hospital South, and the group there asked me to stay on and have a little satellite office over here. So, um, there we go. Okay. So March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Um, we like to make patients aware of this um, because it is one of those hush-hush kind of diseases because nobody obviously wants to talk about their colon or their poop. But um, it is the second leading cause of death um, in, in cancer-related illnesses in the U.S. every year. Um, about 5% of the population will be affected. Um, everybody, of course, asks whether or not um, you know, there's a family history or genetic component that goes along with this, and that's a very small subset. Most of these are sporadic cancers. Um, so family history is very important, um, but that's why we stress to people who don't have family histories that it's also important that they get screened for colon cancer. Um, the risk rises in patients who have things such as ulcerative colitis, um, and like I said, in those patients whose family members have these uh, specific genetic diseases, then their risk goes up significantly. So approximately 140,000 new cases of colorectal cancer are diagnosed every year. Um, and a little over 50,000 people will die from this each year as well. So it's second only to lung cancer in the US. That's pretty significant. You know, we have all of this uh, awareness around breast cancer and other types of cancer, and everybody kind of overlooks this, but it is really important. Uh, Men and women are affected equally, so husbands, wives, take care of each other. So polyps are how we think it actually starts. And polyp-related uh, colorectal cancer is actually preventable. This is why screening colonoscopies are so helpful. Um, so these small little mushroom-like growths um, are actually how they start. And we know that that sequence from polyp to cancer uh, can take about five years um, it, on average. Um, so if we catch these early, we can actually prevent them from turning into a cancer. So this is sometimes what they look like um, when we see them on colonoscopy. And we can biopsy that and even remove that completely so that it doesn't turn into a cancer. So when they're found early, our patients, we, we do everything in five-year survival. So. Our five-year survival, if we catch these cancers early, is over 90%. Pretty darn good, OK? Um, but really, if you look at it, only about 40% of them are diagnosed early enough um, to fall into this category, because people usually aren't getting screened initially, or they aren't following up with the normal screening intervals. Um, so you can see, this is from the American Cancer Society, even only slightly more than half of Americans over 50 are actually getting their normal screening. So our guidelines currently, what we use for our colorectal um, society, um, is that average risk screening begins at age 50. So this is for anyone who doesn't have a family member um, with colon cancer, who doesn't have any of these high risk diseases like ulcerative colitis. Um, we start them at 50. There are brand new recommendations for African Americans to actually start at 45. Um, some of the insurance companies aren't quite covering this yet, um, but we do um, feel you know, strongly enough about it that we will fight them for it. Um, if you have a first degree relative, so this is mother, father, brother, sister, um, or even children, this happens. Um, if they have colon cancer that was diagnosed before the age of 60, then you need to be screened 10 years before the age that they were diagnosed at. So if they were diagnosed at 55, you should get screened at 45. If they were diagnosed at 50, you should get screened at 40. Does that make sense? OK. Um, and then we recommend currently repeat screening every five years. Um, some of the other societies are still saying 10 years. But like I said, we know that it takes five years for these polyps to grow from polyps to cancers. And so we don't want to leave it too long. We'd rather do the colonoscopy, which is fairly low risk and prevent these cancers from forming. So our screening modalities, uh, digital rectal exam, of course, that only reaches up a few centimeters. 
uh, and what we call fecal occult blood testing. So if anybody's ever done this before, they might give you a little card and some stuff to go home with, and then you have to smear it, and we check that for any microscopic signs of blood. Um, these are very kind of nonspecific, um, but they at least maybe spur the process along if someone is positive. Some of the other things that we actually use to physically look at the colon are things like a barium enema, um, which might be one of the most unpleasant tests ever. Flexible sigmoidoscopy is very similar to a colonoscopy. It just doesn't go around the entire colon. It only looks at the lower part of the colon. Uh, but it still has the ability to do biopsies and, and very similar things to a colonoscopy. The colonoscopy, like I mentioned, goes all the way around the colon. So we get a full view of the entire colon. And even sometimes we can kind of sneak into the end of the small intestine where they meet um, so that we can check there too. And then there's something called virtual colonoscopy. Has anybody ever heard of virtual colonoscopy before? Yeah. Who's asked their doctor about it? Yeah, we get that every now and then. Everybody says, well, I want this new virtual colonoscopy. It's like a really fancy CT scan. Um, and they use the images along with some contrast um, to recreate kind of a 3D view of the colon and then can pick up on some lesions or polyps. Um, I think I have something there. So the biggest thing I think everybody's trying to avoid when they ask about it is the prep. Guess what? You still got to prep, okay? So for any of these, even the barium enema um, and the flexible sigmoidoscopy, there needs to be some type of prep. So for all of these that we're looking directly at the colon, there's going to be some prep involved. Now the preps for vo virtual colonoscopy, um, they're trying to make them a little bit better. There's a couple of larger centers like Mayo um, that are trying to come up with some newer uh, preps that aren't so harsh, um, but they're still not there yet. They're not out on the market. So. The problem with the virtual colonoscopy also is that it may miss smaller polyps. So it may be very good at diagnosing things that are, you know, a little larger, say maybe one to two centimeters, but it might miss some of those that are smaller than a centimeter that we can see really easily on a colonoscopy and take care of. And if they find anything on the virtual colonoscopy, you're just going to be referred to have a colonoscopy. So it, I don't think that it... Um, it ended up having as much value when they initially launched it as they thought it was going to. So the gold standard still is a full colonoscopy. Um, these have actually helped to reduce the colon cancer incidence rates um, by 2 to 3% per year. Um, like I said, these polyps can be identified. They can be biopsied and completely removed at the time of the colonoscopy. Um, and that can prevent them from turning into a cancer. And then if a cancer is found, it can be biopsied, and then you can be referred to a surgeon so that it can be handled appropriately. So, the dreaded prep. That's the worst, That's the worst. yes. Um, but you have to understand that this is probably the most crucial part of the procedure. If we can't see the colon walls well, you don't get a good exam. And I remember even as a resident, getting so many calls in the middle of the night of somebody who tried to drink their Go Lightly, the gallon prep, and they'd say, I started and I threw up and I'm still going to come in tomorrow. And we'd say, don't bother. <laughs> because there's a running joke that you know, says that what's worse than a colonoscopy is a second colonoscopy. Okay? Um, so if it's not good enough, we're just going to make you go back home, repeat the prep, and come back another day. Um, so if you, if you ever do schedule your colonoscopy too and get through the prep and it's not going so well, you know, let your doctor know early in the morning so that they can kind of handle it appropriately. Um, so, you know, that, that's really true. If the, if the bowel's not prepped appropriately, we can't see very well. And we might miss some smaller lesions um, that we really we want to catch and find. So what is the prep? You drinking a gallon? We'll of get there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so there was actually a recent study from the Journal of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and they found that as many as a third of polyps are missed when there's not an adequate prep. So that's pretty significant. So it doesn't matter which type of prep you use, the end result is all the same. We have to induce diarrhea. We have to clean out the colon. All right. 
you're going to be best friends with your toilet. So get ready. Get some baby wipes, get whatever diaper cream you need, and go for it. Um, so the preparation, you know, we, we um, always mention to our patients that the day before that they need to not fast, but only uh, go on clear liquids. So no solid food. Anything that you can see through is acceptable. Um, we don't like anything that's colored red, orange, or purple. Because when we look in the colon, that actually looks like blood to us. And it's going to make us get all worked up about, you know, where's this bleeding coming from? And then we're going to start looking for things that really aren't there. So, um, you know, some of the other clear liquids you can take, um, of course, water, juices, um, jello. But be careful, again, with the jellos that you don't jump on all the, all the oranges and stuff. So, all right, now we get to the preps. Um, so, go lightly was... Uh, kind of the old prep, the gallon jug that everybody hated to pick up from the pharmacy, and they included a couple of little packets of lime or cherry or, or some other flavoring in it. And everybody would tell you, go home, mix it up, throw it in the freezer, make a little slushy out of it, and then, you know, chug it as much as you can. And it would just induce vomiting and all these horrible things because it just tasted so nasty. Um, so finally, in about 2006, um, we came up with something called movie prep. Now, this is the same um, solution, a PEG solution, polyethylene glycol, um, that's used in Go Lightly, but it's about half the volume. So it's 32 ounces of the solution um, that, that you consume the night before, um, in some kind, in, along with some clear liquids, um, and then you repeat that in the morning. So it's a total of 64 ounces. Um, now, these are all done as split preps. Um, a lot of the GI doctors uh, will do this because their society believes that this is um, a way to get you a little cleaner and so that you don't have to drink so much volume all at once. So that they split it up where you do uh, this in the evening and then the morning of the procedure um, have the rest of it. I don't completely agree with this only because then you end up starving all day the day of your procedure. And you've already starved the day before because you've only been allowed to have clear liquids. So I do it all at once. But 64 ounces is about as big as a big gulp. So you can do it all at once. It's not really that bad. Um, the soup prep then came out a couple of years later. And this is a different solution, sodium sulfate, potassium sulfate, and magnesium sulfate. Um, and it's a little bit less um, as far as the volume of what you have to drink. Um, and again, it's, it's usually done as a split prep. This was actually one of the first ones that was designed to do as a split prep. Um, and it also works really good. So everybody asks, isn't there a pill that you can give me? Yes, there is. It's called Osma Prep. All right? It's actually sodium phosphate tablet. So for anybody who has any kidney damage, it is an absolute no-go. Okay. Um, all of these products will induce some diarrhea and dehydration, but this one in particular really affects the kidneys with that, and people can go into worsening kidney failure. Okay, we've even seen patients end up on dialysis temporarily because of this. So if you have any kidney dysfunction whatsoever, you need to tell your doctor before they give you a prep so that they know this and, and can avoid these, okay? Um, now, this one is nice if you don't like to drink a lot of volume or if you don't like any of the solutions. Um, but you have to understand that it's 32 pills, and they are very large. Um, so <laughs> it's not always as pleasant as it seems. Um, but like I said, you know, with it, you can just drink water, ginger ale, um, you know, whatever kind of juice you like. So there's no restriction on what type of uh, liquids you have, um, except, again, for the coloring. Um, so it, it is a good alternative if you don't want to drink any of those other solutions. Now this is actually what I use. Um, Miralax is another PEG solution. Um, it's an over-the-counter stool softener. You can get it anywhere. We have our patients buy a 238 gram bottle and mix that with Gatorade. Okay? There's a couple of little Dulcolax tablets that are mixed in there um, that you should take you know, a couple of different times. Um, but it's very easy to get. You don't need a prescription for it, so there's no excuses of, well, I lost, my, I lost my prescription, and now I can't go to the pharmacy and get my prep. Well, this one, it doesn't matter. 
Um, it also tastes pretty good. Miralax is odorless and tasteless, so you're just mixing it with Gatorade, which is really not that bad. Most people like Gatorade, um, and our patients tolerate it pretty well, so there's not a lot of the nausea, vomiting, and all that kind of stuff with a lot of the other preps. Then there's a brand new one, Prepopic. Um, for anybody who likes to chug anything, this is, this is it. Um, it's only five ounces of the solution, so it's a very small amount, and it's split into two um, doses. Um, this one actually works really well. It's a little hard to find right now because it's so new. So if you do want this, if you talk to your doctor, make sure that your colonoscopy is not going to be scheduled the next day because you may need some time for your pharmacy to order it for you. Um, but it is available, um, and our patients that have tried it really do like it. So looking at the cost of all of these, um, you know, without any insurance, just looking at the raw cost of it, um, it ranges from about $12 for the Miralax and Dulcolax combination, and that's, that's out of pocket, but $12, $12 isn't too, too much, um, to about $145 for the Prepopic. Um, now, most of the insurance companies will actually kind of steer the doctors toward the ones that are, that are less expensive. Um, so even now, you know, we're on electronic medical records here at the hospital, and when I try to order things for patients, um, electronically to the pharmacy, um, it'll go through and they'll tell me that I can't order things like the Prepopic, okay? And then we, if the patient's willing to pay for it, we just write the prescription out and let them fill it themselves. Um, but there are some restrictions by the insurance companies because they do want you to go sometimes with the lower cost alternatives. Um, thanks. That's about it. We'll leave it for lots of questions. <laughs>